Welcome to this super awesome panel. Um, so we'll dive right in. I'll give a very, very short introduction about all the three panelists. So we have Devlina Bhattacharji. She is the founder and CEO of Numer8, uh, which is redefining applications of geospatial technologies for improving the livelihood of fishermen, actually, you know, the, the fisher folk, the coastal fisher folk, which is very, very interesting. I've never seen anyone really work on this in the mainstream before. And, and then we have uh, Shobita Shetty. Uh, so Devlina is joining us from Mumbai, right? Are you Mumbai. Mumbai? Awesome, Mumbai. And next we have Shobita Shetty. She is joining us from Norway and she is a PhD researcher right now and she's working on air pollution. And she has a master's from uh, the Indian Institute of Remote Sensing and also the University of Twente. Uh, from the Netherlands, and she was very interestingly previously uh, an SAP developer, and she also worked with Satyar. So, welcome, uh, Shobita. And we have uh, Krishna Nambutri. I've known her for uh, millions of years. <laughs> we were at the same. We, we, we did our undergrad together, and we. Um, and uh, Krishna is the data science product manager actually at Satyar right now, and she is working currently on farm credit scoring, and she was also with ISRO for about three years. So welcome everyone, welcome panelists, and welcome uh, the guests, the audience. And lastly, so hello everyone, uh, in case you don't know me, I'm, uh, uh, it's not like I'm so popular, but anyways. <laughs> um, so I'm Rachna, um, um, I'm a development engineer working with uh, Berlin Space Technologies, a company that builds satellites in uh, Berlin, Germany. And I had also previously worked with um, the Indians uh, ISRO, uh, for about five years and then I moved to Germany and I also did uh, a short uh, a degree in uh, space law, space and telecommunication laws just for kicks so I can understand a little bit of legal parlance and uh, please do check out my uh, podcast. So I host a podcast called Those Space People so which features these casual conversations which we have amongst space people so do check it out. Uh, I have guests from across the world. Okay end of my um, mind truck and we'll dive in and I want to ask the first question to Krishna because you were working on launch vehicle development at ISRO which is one of the super awesome coolest things to do so how and if we may know why did you pivot you know to machine learning and eventually geospatial data analytics hi Rachana thank you so much for the introduction and this is it's great let's see uh, how the rest of the evening pans out. So yeah, thank you for the introduction again. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned, after my bachelor's in avionics from IAST, I went on to work in Indian Space Research Organization for three years. I was a project engineer with Geo, uh, GSLB Mark III. However, I was not in a very technical role, which I would have liked to work. It was more on the project management side. And then after a couple of years, I decided I wanted to do higher studies. And that's how I moved to US to pursue my master's from University of Notre Dame. And it just so happened that my professor was doing some project uh, which had which was applying systems theory to machine learning. So I did not start out with machine learning exactly, but all machine learning and data science is just glorified and computational optimization and other mathematical principles. So that's how I started out, how to apply the principles of optimization, topology, etc. in machine learning. And thus I moved to machine learning slowly. And when I was looking for jobs, I was just looking for a data science role, which actually involved data and machine learning rather than just use the word data and AI as a buzzword. And that sure for sure does that. That's how I ended up in this position. Cool. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So um, and Shobita, actually, you were an SAP developer, right? So how did this transition happen for you? Right. Yeah. So I joined SAP as a developer because I was keenly interested in programming at that moment. Uh, so I worked on developing software tools, which in, in the finance module that helps in tax reporting for various countries. Uh, but then back then I would see that as okay, I'm developing tax reporting, which are of different formats, belonging to different countries. The label countries wouldn't matter much. 
uh, but earth observation was something that I was always interested in. So after having two satisfactory years of working in uh, SAP, uh, I started streamlining towards uh, earth observation, GIS, and remote sensing. And that's when I did my master's uh, in uh, earth observation and uh, GIS from IARS at ITC, which was like best of both worlds, combining so uh, teaching from both areas. Um, well, yeah, that's how I moved from this stream to this stream. Wow, nice. So that's how you caught the space bug, huh? I, I know it's yeah. very <laughs> it's very addictive. Um, Devlina, mm -hmm. you uh you you have a lot of prior experience, right? Even before Numerate, you have been working, uh you've been doing a lot of data analytics and working in uh, data intelligence, but in non-space sectors. So like why did you move to how did the space bug <laughs> bite you basically? Uh well uh well, to be honest, in my corporate days, we uh, one of the projects I was part of was in MathSat. So uh, it's not that I started the space uh, hunt in in my entrepreneurial years. But even if you if you really look at it, I don't you know the kind of work that we do. We deal with uh, multiple kinds of data. So space data is one more the uh, data form for me. So uh, that way, agnostic. I think uh, it's all it's always to do with the kind of problem you're solving. Uh, for that, if you have to really uh, delve with special and non-special data, there's a last thing in your mind. Uh, and uh, where we come and what the kind of work we do, we uh, end up kind of fusing spatial with non-spatial data. So that way we are, uh, you know, the team that we have uh, is capable enough to um, uh, slice and dice uh, both kinds of data and that way, you know, we end up, you know, solving the problem that we're solving. So it's not really, you know, it, it, we don't, uh, you know, deal it, deal it with the geospatial lens. We deal it with the data analysis or data science lens. Okay, wow, that's uh, that's interesting. And what what all kinds of data do you use? You know, I'm sure you use a lot of uh, non-space based data as well. Uh, you know, maybe you can give an example of your product, Ofish. Right. So uh, the current product that we are uh, working uh, is Ofish, and it is for the fisheries industry, as you uh, you know uh, mentioned. And uh, in that, we use a bunch of data sets uh, from very geospatial perspective. We use Earth observation, uh, ocean observation data, which gives you, uh, you know, various aspects of the ocean, the chlorophyll or the surface temperatures. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, bathymetry data coming in. Uh, you have, we do uh, weather data modeling. So a lot of, uh, you know, uh, weather analysis happens. And then uh, since we are working across the supply chain, it's not just stops uh, at the ocean. So then we kind of go up the supply chain. We have transaction data modeling. We have a big part of the work that we do is livelihood analysis. So we do profile data analysis of fishermen. So all that together, it's a uh, it's a combined solution for the seafood sector. And uh, yeah, and multiple, it's multivariate data analysis. Okay, wow, that's interesting. So maybe going a little deeper into how data you know all this is done uh, maybe i can ask krishna you can respond to this uh, so you are a data science product manager right so what exactly is the role of uh, this position all right so we have project we have a business team which takes care of you know how to interact with the clients what are the client requirements and how well we can meet those demands and we also have a data science team which works purely on technical side, we just analyzing a bunch of data and deriving meaningful information. Now, a product manager serves as a link between these two teams in which you can translate these business requirements into data science problems. For example, if you have a if you have a requirement, then what does it translate into with respect to a given data set? What are the relations we can find? And more important, and that is one side of it. And the second aspect would be how can we meet the deadlines? How can we meet? A, how can we plan a timeline to deliver these products? So that would be the role of a product manager. So there will be a sufficient technical knowledge involved with respect to how well can you implement a model, and also a certain amount of tactics and emotional uh, side of it. Yeah, how to build this team. Okay, so um, when you're so when you're talking about the engineering aspect of it, right, like the actual development of the product, uh, do you require how much of domain knowledge do you require? Right. So uh, when I'm uh, speaking from a data scientist 
perspective, like Devlina mentioned, very often, okay, so when we talk about geospatial data scientists, they can come from two backgrounds. Either you can come from a geospatial background, with, which means you have done a remote sensing masters, you have studied all the remote sensing related software management, everything. And then you come and learn that is one dimension of a geospatial data scientist to know the geospatial aspects. The second one is to know the data science and machine learning methods, which is, you know, starting from Python coding to database management to machine learning uh, models, deep learning methods, etc. So you can come from either of these backgrounds and learn the other. For example, I came from a data science background and then I picked up the geospatial knowledge by I was at Satsure. But there are also I have colleagues who came from a geospatial background. They picked up the machine learning model on the in the job. Mm. So either way, it is a marriage between these two fields. Okay, wow, that's uh, cool. So um, Shobita, actually, I'd like to ask uh, because you previously worked with IIRS, right, which is the Indian Institute of Remote Sensing like in India, and now you're with the Norwegian Institute. So maybe can you compare like how remote sensing or geospatial data basically research geospatial research is done differently in India and Scandinavia or maybe even Europe? OK, yeah, I mean, I studied in uh, Indian Institute of uh, IARS. Yeah, and uh, now doing PhD here. Well, the difference, I think I can say difference in terms of countries would be more in uh, terms of the focus area of research using the remote sensing data or geospatial data is quite different because localized problem is different in each country. And uh, more than that, the difference that I could see uh, between the countries is the uh, amount of uh, open data sets being available, the density of open data sets, and uh, also the acceptance and uh, encouragement to this field. So if you do a quick job search uh, in geospatial field, you can see based on the location uh, of the research or any uh, private or public sector jobs that's available, you can see the difference. So this, this difference shows how integrated the geospatial uh, technology uh, or data is in the daily process in different countries, right? So in India, I'd say this opportunity is limited. Uh, so there are like companies like Satcha, Numerate, using these data, right? Uh, explore, ex, uh, exploring and exploiting the potential of geospatial data, but how difficult or easy it is for them, uh, you know, to put it in the market and convince the customer. That's another another aspect, you know. So that acceptance is yet to be reached. Is what I could see. Probably Devlina can comment on this better because she had first-hand experience on that. Yeah. So that's a small gap over here in uh, two different locations. Yeah, that's uh, actually interesting because um, maybe uh, like like Shobita said, Devlina, you can also talk about it because, um, uh, you know, most of the upstream, when we speak of space, most of the upstream mm -hmm. is all mostly US centric. A lot of the companies are there, a lot of activity happens there. Uh, but do you think, uh, but, but on the other hand, when we talk about downstream or geospatial applications, mm -hmm. uh, developing countries seems like they have, uh, uh, you know, there's probably more potential because we have like a very diverse and a very different or much larger problem sets as such. And also, and Devlina, since you've worked in uh, several Asian countries in the Southeast Asia, and you know, you're quietly um, worked in a lot of different geographies. So do you, what do you think about this? Do you think we have a much bigger scope uh, in developing countries? No, definitely. I think, you know, uh, we are currently only, uh, you know, gleaning the surface of, uh, you know, the applications of the geospatial, um, uh, you know, uh, data. Uh, to be honest, if I really, you know, when you talk about geospatial data and uh, an application in India or in developing countries, the first thing that comes to, comes to your head is agriculture. Uh, I think that's the that's the place uh, that's the uh, you know uh, industry that has seen uh, the most application of it. Uh, but uh, and then comes some disaster, and then maybe comes some you know disease mapping, and then maybe comes some tra you know uh, tra traffic analysis. But then transportation, things like supply chain, things like you know government functions, things like waste management, uh, you know water management. There's 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 lo loads of such application, and when you talk about you know government bodies who are analyzing uh, this as a vast uh, scope, not like startups. I mean, I'm talking about organization where actually you know uh, you know building it, they do not really think about this problem of where, you know, the third dim dimension to it. They always take it from a 2D model. So I believe it, 
they definitely need education. Uh, uh, to give you an example, I think I was talking to Rachna about it, uh, and I would like to talk, you know, tell the audience about it as well. So, a uh, little experience of mine of when, uh, you know, a very um, recently uh, uh, IIT professor was telling me that he's trying to solve the problem of uh, COVID vaccine uh, supply chain in India. And that they have come up with a model that has, uh, you know, great efficiency of uh, you know, kind of uh, delivering COVID vaccine to the remotest part of India. But when I asked, did you add a geospatial model to it or do you add a location component to it? The answer was no. But how do you really solve the supply chain uh, without a location component? Won't it be different from a town to a, a village? So the the concept, you know, the um, the fact that you know this kind of data is available first of all, and this kind of data is part of the problem needs to be taught. And where you know we can come in, and I think we are, we are the companies like uh, you know uh, Numidate and Sashure, we can come in and kind of you know have this education done in in, in the where you know it can be applied to many uh, you know, applications. The other thing is that we have to really. Uh, make sure to tell people that it is no longer niche industry. It is available. It is easily applicable and it's not it's not costly as well. Uh, whenever you talk about satellite data, people think it's costly, but there is a lot of open source satellite data that you can still use without even paying a penny. So all those things need to happen. The dialogue needs to happen, and then I think that slowly, you know, the industry will adapt to the uh, factor of waking waking up to the you know, third dimension that is there. It can be applied to the entire socioeconomic problems that they're trying to solve. Yeah, wow, that's uh, this is very interesting. The location thing that you've mentioned, right? Because um, I mean, it is definitely common knowledge that um, a product, a geospatial product that works in, let's say, Europe or in the US, North America, uh, does not really work in. You know, it can't be really scaled to countries like Brazil or I don't know, African countries or something. While we can totally scale a product that works in Philippines or like India to these countries. So that's uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. And actually, this brings me to this point that um, so when we use AI, there's a lot of uh, AI machine learning, all these being used in uh, developing these products. So I'm pretty sure there are a lot of and when you speak of AI, there's a lot of uh, bias, right? There's a lot of um, I don't know, there's something called fair AI, you know, fairness in the AI. So uh, I think Krishna, maybe uh, because you with your background in machine learning, would you like to talk about how this is ensured? Yeah, definitely. Fairness in AI is something I have worked since my grad school and how to one of the like the famous case studies of how there is racial injustice when you learn the prisoner model. Like, I mean, there are many such examples, gender bias and when it comes to employment, even there are famous examples of recruitment tools biasing against women when you go through the resumes, things like that. So when you uh, look at the sat so you would imagine, OK, but satellite images are sort of, you know, they are uh, be beyond all these. They have no such, but they come with their own set of biases. Just like you mentioned, the models that are applicable in the US or Europe may not work in India. When you look at any object detection model, any standard deep network model that has been trained on an American data set will not mm -hmm. give good results in India. So that is one bias to start with. Second bias is even when it comes to metrics, how are we going to measure certain parameters? You should know the location specific aspect. If you're using the same metric that you uh, use to assess a farm in the US, you cannot use the same metric in India because the soil conditions are different, the weather conditions are different, the cropping patterns are different. So when uh, when it comes to bias, you have to start with from the ground level. You have to look at the data. Where, what is the source of the data starting from there? And many often the data scientists who are sitting very, you know, kilometers, hundreds of kilometers away, they may not be aware of those ground facts. So there is a need for expert knowledge in this matter. So uh, how to dis even even if you look at a place like India, considering the geographical variability, you cannot use the same some score, agricultural score that you are using in a rain fed. I'm talking about, let's say uh, we are assessing farms all across India. You cannot use the same method to validate a farm in a rain fed tropical area as compared to a irrigation fed farm in a desert area like Rajasthan. 
so these differences have to be really understood in that and that has to happen that effort has to go into data in in into model modeling phase and otherwise we will be just per perpetuating this bias okay yeah 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 i mean with more diversity uh, increasing diversity in all these tech sectors uh, i think we can go in that direction certainly yeah. hopeful about it. yeah um, and actually shobita so coming to your research um, so i'm a little surprised that there is air research on air pollution being done in Norway <laughs> because Norway is definitely not one of the top 10 countries anybody thinks of when you think of air pollution, right? So, uh, so why is Norway researching on air pollution and like how is it done across the world? And yeah, maybe you could talk about your work and your research. Uh, yeah. I, I do get this question many times when I say, uh, you know, I'm working in an institute in Norway on air pollution. Yeah, so the concept that we get when we talk about air pollution is we imagine traffic, smog, and that's it. We imagine that to be the main source of uh, air pollution. Uh, but that's not the case. There are a lot of localized uh, uh, sources of air pollution. Yes, Norway is relatively uh, uh, less polluted than other countries, but still there is pollution. It is important to always maintain pollution levels within uh, the WHO limits. So that it doesn't, it's not harmful uh, for the population or, you know, the further harm the atmosphere. So being less polluted, still you have to continuously monitor uh, the pollution patterns in, in every country. So it's good that Norway still invests in, uh, you know, uh, in uh, such field. Uh, further, uh, so there are further problems over here. For example, due to extreme winters. Uh, there's a lot of wood burning that happens in every household, and this causes a lot of aerosol pollution. Uh, and then uh, uh, there are, uh, during winters, there are spikes on the tires and there are gravels on the uh, pavement so that, you know, you don't slip. But the friction of these also contribute to good amount of carbon uh, being put into the atmosphere. So there are a lot of, uh, aeros uh, you know, uh, sources of air pollution even in Norway. And uh, it's not just that air pollution is not localized. Uh, the movement of the pollutants. We would have seen how uh, famous images from uh, NASA, where you know Sahara Desert uh, um, uh, storm carries these dust from one place to another. So that's also an aerosol. It causes pollution. So what I mean to say is, it cannot be a localized research area. It it should be a global effort and. Uh, uh, there's already negative trends of climate change that we can see and it's even predicted for the next years. And it's important to continuously cut down the emissions and monitor how the pollution levels are varying throughout different places. Uh, even though pandemic had imposed lockdown, uh, lockdowns in 2020, it turned out to be still the warmest, uh, one of the warmest years on record because of the past climate change effects. So yeah. Uh, the point I want to make here is the monitoring and continuous monitoring of air pollutants is always important. And I think the developed countries and others, uh, other space agencies do see this importance and invest in such research, which comes under the umbrella of climate change. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I totally agree. Like um, the per capita carbon footprint is definitely higher in a developing country. So yeah, that's, yep. uh, that's really nice. And what kind of images, uh, what kind of data sources do you use to monitor or to you know characterize air pollution? Yeah, so uh, I'm using combination of different data sources, mainly being uh, satellite data. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing with satellite data is that it gives you uh, the pollution uh, throughout a column. Uh, but the pollution is usually varying at different uh, levels as you go up the altitude. So uh, what I'm exploring is how we can use the satellite data as well as few ground monitoring stations mm -hmm. and combine them and get a more continuous uh, uh, details about the uh, pollution levels at different regions across Europe. Wow, wow that's interesting. Um, uh, just one little question. Um, is this what is the business case here, right? Like, who would be your uh, for for an entrepreneur, perhaps? Uh, maybe I don't know if you're looking at business cases, but just out of curiosity, who would pay to get this kind of data or insights? Uh, uh, government bodies, basically for policy planning, uh, and also that there are targets to be met if uh, set by IPCC regarding uh, 
temperature warming and the limits that you have for air pollution. Uh, you know, you have like a limit of being 10, mic having 10 micrograms uh, per meter cube of uh, aerosols is, uh, in your location is, supposed, uh, is considered to be okay. Beyond that, it's more. So to monitor all these and report these to the government body, it's, it's always important. Okay. And such applications will be useful. Nice. So mm -hmm. speaking of uh, business models, right? I, um, Devlina, like you, because right now with OFISH and your other products, service fishermen, uh, fisher people, fisher folk, is the right word, fisher folk and retailers. Uh, so uh, do you see, like in, in future, uh, do you see this, uh, your your customers mostly being the government or such bodies like Shopita mentioned, or do you see yourself, you know, as a B2C unicorn sometime in the future? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I have some comments on the word unicorn. Can I uh, talk about it before I come to the use case and the, and the, and the B2C and the government aspect of it? So I think uh, since we have a, you know, 50 people audience, I would like to, uh, 49 people audience. Uh, so I think unicorn, the word was, the term was coined to say a company valued to be 1 billion. Uh, so, uh, and as of today, I believe there is more than 500 odd unicorns across the world. So statistically, that term no longer is applicable. <laughs> you know, we should be, and but yeah, we know, you know, when you say unicorn, it is kind of, uh, we are relating that to a company who is doing well, but does not really signify the top line. But I think where you come, you know, uh, question is coming from, can we build a viable, profitable business uh, of a geospatial business targeting customers rather than government. For our case, um, a government is not yet our customers. We love to work with the government uh, because it's a large ticket size, a large revenue pool, it's a large geography. We'd love to uh, have government as our customers. But for a startup of a size, uh, what typically happens is that government, uh, it's a long sales cycle. So you really need a lot of money power and firepower and patience to really wait for such uh, use cases to appear. But, and we have been talking to the government for a while. Uh, but on the other hand, the kind of uh, work we are doing for the fisher folk, fisher folks, or, uh, you know, they are our primary beneficiaries and customers. And I believe definitely you can have a, you know, viable a model, uh, you know, focusing on a customer problem. And I would say, especially for the work that we do, uh, it has, fishery sector has always been a top down model so everybody has talked about okay what policy can i you know give to a fisherman or what policy can i give to a kerala uh, fisherman versus a maharashtra fisherman or what kind of practices should i have what kind of monitoring should i have but the entire fishery sector if you really look at it is never from a bottom up level and that's i think that's the difference that we are creating we understand the customer problem very well and uh, we uh, know where our uh, you know you know, which side of the uh, you know, supply chain we are most focusing on. And that is where we are coming in. And and there are, you know, 4 million fisher folks, only marine fisher folks in India alone. Uh, and we're talking about 67 countries across the world, 800 million people, depending on the fisheries uh, sector. Uh, so that way, I believe, uh, if you get your metrics right, if you get your problem statement right, if you get your, uh, you know, solution right, uh, definitely a big company, not maybe a unicorn, but you can definitely have a profitable company <laughs> made out of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but but uh, yeah, that's, that's good to know. Uh, but uh, we see a lot of, especially when we speak of uh, geospatial and, you know, the upstream mm -hmm. sector, there's a lot of vertical integration that's being done, right? So every, a lot of people are following this planet approach. You know, you build the satellite, you operate, you launch it, uh, not launch it, but operate it, mm -hmm. and then also uh, make a lot of data products out of it. So do you think geos companies like like you like uh, like numerate which are only doing the geospatial part of it do you think companies like you will can still be in business sure so there are uh, two or three parts of of this question so one is like uh, do i call myself as a geospatial company uh, i would say no because we dabble with many different data so i definitely geospatial is a forte without the geospatial data i won't be able to apply your solution but again, uh, it depends on what the kind of services you're providing. Suppose I am a company that provides, um, say, soil monitoring for that matter. I provide the best soil monitoring and I provide it uh, in real time and across the world. You give me uh, one uh, you know, square footage, I'll tell you the, you know, the soil quality. Everybody will use my service. So I, and then I can integrate across multiple platforms to provide that. I either do that. Or I, you know, uh, be have a different stack, and I, I, uh, you know, pick a focus area. For us, the focus area has been fisheries because it is a largely, uh, you know, neglected sector. So that way, you can really build your solution and really choose your customer or your market. 
Um, to your question of vertical integration, I would say, uh, you know, what I really saw in uh, Europe, uh, you know, in, in, in the European Commission came up with this, and Shobita might be knowing it, came up with this four, four or five different, uh, you know, uh, geospatial data provider. Uh, called DIAS, where if you log into that, you'll be able to access, uh, you know, Sentinel and NASA data and have some tools and gadgets to really um, uh, slice and dice the data. This was in 2017. Then came uh, AWS and, uh, you know, uh, GCP who started providing uh, geospatial data to all users because they realized that a bunch of their customers have uh, need geospatial data. So they definitely, definitely integrated with the geospatial data. So, as a company, you always have to, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of grow with the industry. So um, if I'm just calling myself a geospatial data and I'm only doing certain things like a soil analysis and to be so good in the game that nobody can, else can beat it, or else I kind of integrate with the existing uh, you know, solutions in the industry or existing, you know, providers so that I can grow along with the, as and when this industry grows. Yeah, I completely agree with Dave Lina on that. And, you know, uh, it's about time considering the applications that we have in geospatial industry today. It's, I think we should look past just the geospatial dimension of it and just think of it mm -hmm. as another data set, like even uh, like she was mentioning earlier, just think of it as another value you can add to all your other products, whatever it be, you know, be it location specific. Mm -hmm applications or any other monitoring service so yeah that way we can add value to plenty of industries and probably that's the way we should be looking at it rather than looking at it as a diff completely different niche and domain yeah okay yeah and uh, i think uh, the the best best place we as a uh, you know geospatial or earth observation data analytics company are is that it does not restrict us from I'm augmenting ourselves with multiple other you know, data sets, yeah. and so that way we uh, we are in a uh, you know in a good place, and we can broaden our horizons to uh, other options. I mean, it can be an IoT integration, it can be uh, you know uh, a demography data integration, it can be anything. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, and uh, there is one question that I al always uh, have, right? So, as someone who works in the upstream. Uh, who contributes to a lot of potential space debris. <laughs> you so, want to know if there is still business, uh, still job for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, more than that, uh, yeah, that's also an interesting question. Uh, more than that, um, what I'm always wondering is, there are a lot of satellites, right? In the next 10 years, there are like 10,000, so many constellations planned. Uh, even if we not count, discount the, uh, the uh, SATCOM, you know, the LEO communication, uh, com constellations in LEO. Uh, there are a lot of Earth observation constellations and satellites planned, but is the imagery uh, which is generated, being generated right now, is that sufficient, you know, in terms of frequency bands or, you know, quality, repetitivity uh, or geography? Do you, are you, because as someone who's working, uh, as someone who uses geospatial you know, and satellite imagery on an everyday basis, do you find, is the, is the imagery that's publicly available right now or in the near future, is that sufficient? It's, it's for all of you guys. <laughs> I, I can go. I, mean, uh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, the data is available. The way it is made available is not sufficient. Uh, the way it is. Uh, so, you know, for us to really keep a, a everyday business up and available, we need the data to be uh, available all the time. I should not wait for the data. It should be easily accessible by my cloud servers. It should be easily downloadable. Uh, so yeah, so I think uh, you know the in our in our case we uh, find a lot of a gap in historical data availability. So sometimes we um, uh, you know try to uh, build our models so the historical data is not available all the time. So uh, that way, I believe uh, data sufficiency is something the problem that all our geospatial companies deal with. Um, and that definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, for example, if I have to, uh, and for you know people who are from the non-GIS sector, for us to really an analyze where do I get a certain parameter of uh, oceans like an SST, I have to really uh, go through multiple different sources and understand, okay, this SST parameter suits me. Maybe that can be broken down and made it easier for commercial applications where you really don't have to dabble around uh, various different sources and then figure out, okay, this source suits me. So one single point of such multiple various uh, data providers will make uh, you know, our job very easy.
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, yes, uh, I'd also like to add to this question whether there's enough data. Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, there's a lot of data. Um, but there's always a trade off between the spatial and temporal resolution of this data, uh, depending on what field uh, you want to apply it for. For example, uh, agriculture or land changes, probably it's okay not to have data of every day. Uh, but uh, coming, I can speak in more, more in terms of uh, uh, the atmospheric data right now. Uh, since the pollutants and uh, atmosphere constants are so dynamically moving, so it's important to have this data every day. So yes, the current uh, atmospheric uh, satellite data sets do provide this at uh, resolution, the latest Sentinel 5P being at three cross five kilometer resolution. But uh, this is every day, uh, but we need every three hours, something like that to get a efficient uh, uh, understanding of the patterns of these pollutants. Uh, yeah. So that is something uh, we we need, uh, but yes, there is something planned for such things too. So uh, satellites such as geostationary satellites, which focus on smaller regions rather than you know the uh, whole global co coverage. So they give data uh, focusing on a smaller region at higher temporal resolution. But hey, again, you have uh, a trade off between spatial resolution there. So mm -hmm. yeah, it depends on the field. I would say yeah. Yeah, the same. Yes and no. There are there is mm -hmm. enough. There is more than enough data that we have now. More than we can process, but for certain applications. But for so, if we are looking at more diverse applications, it's just a matter of how much more we want to use the geospatial data. And for certain applications, there is still a dearth of data. And I remember uh, I would I'll plug in your podcast, Rachana. I think in one of the episodes, the founder of Orbital EOS, he wanted to find oil spills and he wanted yeah, to detect yeah. oil spills and uh, other act maritime activities. And yeah. even he mentioned there is not enough frequency or a solution data available for such maritime applications. Yeah, that yeah. would be one example. And uh, another, then all, obviously the the better resolution data the I mean, we are going to get more and more insights, right? Of course, there are AI methods like for super resolution to convert a 10 meter resolution data to one meter resolution data by using very fancy deep learning models. But it has been shown that developing such complex models, obviously, they also come with a lot of carbon footprint and a lot of mm -hmm. resources like GPT-3. So after a point, uh, making these complex models on the available satellite data might be actually more costly than sending out a satellite. So you have to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And yeah, I mean, it's also good to know that there's a huge dearth of data. So Krishna, my job, uh, I guess, is secure <laughs> in the next 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, and also, Devlina, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of times you have to educate the market about how uh, geospatial data can be used. So, on the, um, so moving on to the entrepreneurial side, because you're the entrepreneur here, uh, especially that geospatial domain is not really understood uh, by potential customers and therefore also, I don't know, potential investors. So, as a bootstrapped um, entrepreneur, I'm assuming you're bootstrapped, please correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I have a I have a lot of um, camaraderie with bootstrapped uh, entrepreneurs. I have them all around Thank me you. <laughs> for a long time. So a lot of uh, yeah, I'm proud of you for doing it. But what kind of challenges have you faced? Um, you know, as as a bootstrapped entrepreneur. Okay, where do I start? Okay, but <laughs> keeping it short, I think we have a very unique uh, uh, you know case for ourselves. So. Uh, at one end, we are using uh, satellite data and we are using it for uh, fishing. So uh, the very uh, start of that uh, dialogue, uh, nobody really understands as well, unless and until people know uh, what we're talking about. And that's where it's like, you know, 10 percent of the population uh, that we uh, that we speak to. Um, so, uh, you know, and uh, I would say, uh, I mean, it's 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 both for us. It's about uh, working with the fishery sector that uh, uh, not very many people does, especially with the marine sector that was very unique for us. Uh, even our, in a, 
when it, when we spoke to our customers, we are having to educate our customers saying that how satellite data is applicable for them. And when we talk to the other other side of the uh, you know spectrum, we talk to them how fisheries are an application of satellite data. So it's a continuous evolving process for us, and it has been difficult. It has taken us some time. Uh, I would say on a for uh, running a bootstrap company, what uh, what has been our primary challenge is to able to. Uh, and of course, the fact that there is no ready models or ready reference that we can take an example for. So there was no such applications where you can say, OK, they did it this way. Uh, we will do this this way. Everything was a customer experience. Everything was learning from the customer. So a lot of time spent on the ground, uh, talking to fisher folks, understanding their uh, problem, where none of us from the fishery sector, uh, you know, being able to really uh, do that uh, has given us, it has been a challenge. It has been a difficulty, but it has also uh, given us you know, solid understanding of the business and um, build the relationship that uh, the kind of business that we do demands. Uh, and so it, uh, I, I would say the challenges has been opportunities in really deep diving into the sector. If if I, you know, uh, I have this uh, thoughts in my brain where I think that, you know, if suppose I kind of pivoted out of fisheries and I you know did something on a very, uh, you know, uh, thin line saying just providing uh, uh, just using ocean observation data and giving something, uh, I I would have not been able to really capture uh, the, the the problem that is nobody else is doing. So that way, it has it, it has taken some time from from my end, but really made us unique. Uh, from the investor perspective, I believe uh, you know how you approach the problem, how do you how you tell your story really matters. If you're just talking about uh, you know data science and mechanics and uh, leading edge technologies and uh, that's nothing. You have to show them. Okay, where is the money and why it's such a big market, and wh where is the opportunity? So the investor lingo is definitely different, and there is definitely a, a story that we have here to present. So yeah, yeah. so it's, it's different audience, different story, different kind of uh, uh, you know um, tapping into. Nice. What's it, Edison who once said you might be able to tax it one day? Uh, sorry. Was it Edison who once said famously that you might be able to tax it one day? What is the use of electricity? Something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That actually brings us to this really nice question that uh, we have from the audience. So the question is uh, from Krishna, from another Krishna. So he asks, uh, how important and to what extent will geospatial data become integral for policy making in the future? Any Anybody wants to comment on this? Is yeah, it I part of policy making? I don't think it's, it's it, it is uh, being considered now, but I think it should uh, ideally be considered. I mean, if you're talking about livelihood, if you're talking about uh, you know any any kind of government policies for that matter, uh, it uh, uh, government policies about uh, you know addressing a certain sector, a certain economic section. So any kind of social econ uh, socio economic problem has a space time component to it. Uh, how is a uh, uh, poverty rate improving over time, or how where it is the uh, where it is people are suffering from poverty? So to give an example of this, you know we were the only company talking about uh, solving food security from the seas, from the ocean perspective. Uh, why food security is location has a location component? Because when you're talking about food security solving from the land, you're talking about uh, people who are uh, you know using the land based uh, resources. But what about the you know 800 million people who are dependent on seafood as a sector. So location is a big component for any such policy making. If you want to do a policy making for uh, you know uh, miners or uh, you know a mining industry, you need to understand the land they live, live in. Uh, what is their connectivity to the rest of the uh, you know world? Uh, so yeah, I mean definitely, definitely uh, a big uh, uh, you know a, a big factor for any kind of uh, policy making from from my perspective. Over to you guys. Yeah, I definitely agree with Devlina. Uh, like I mentioned before, I think in future we will start looking at geospatial data just as another service that we have. Like how people assume everyone has internet now, we will assume. Yeah. yeah. As long as we reach the point where we have uh, the right data from this whole dump of uh, data sets, I think it yeah. will be right time to integrate it in all aspects possible. Yeah, that's uh, definitely, definitely true, especially for, I think, uh, countries like India, right? We are so complex and vast and diverse, so we definitely need all the technological help we can. Uh, yeah. 
And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about, I know we are nearing the end. Uh, we have probably another 10, 15 minutes, but I'd quickly like to know what you, uh, your perspective, all three of your perspective is uh, on the future of geospatial, right? Like how do you see the sector panning? And also when you talk about data, there's now a lot of importance placed on data privacy and there's a lot of biases, you know, like we discussed previously. Yeah. So how do you see all this evolving in the next few decades? Yeah, so, you know, before we, uh, yes, there is, like we mentioned, like we just talked that there is a huge potential for geospatial data in the future. There, there is going to be a huge uh, impact on the policy making side of it. But before we come to that, maybe we should also be co conscious and a little be aware of the guidelines that has to be in place. Because even now we see that the cyber space has increased so much, but cybersecurity laws are probably not up to the mark and we see the crimes because of that. So in a similar fashion, probably we should have good guidelines to guide us in this path before we reach an all encompassing geospatial domain future. So yeah, like you mentioned, biases are an important, just like humans have prejudices, any a human that creates a model also has prejudices. That is something we should agree. And then privacy, of course, that is another crucial information. Uh, let's take two case studies. Let's say one disaster management policy in which, yes, there is a humanitarian crisis. We should all hands should be on the deck and we should be able to gather all the data that we can from all sources to help mitigate that situation. So for that, we should make the, all the data public. Now let's consider another application in which we are using the weather parameters and vegetation patterns to identify the location of some endangered species. Should we really make that data, make that location on a map public? Probably not. So there will be such sensitive information, uh, you know, so there has to be that understanding in the community regarding what data has to be public and what has to be private. And so, yeah, that's my yeah, understanding. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, any of you yeah. go ahead? Yeah. Before yeah. You just I just interrupt. wanted to add a comment. Yeah. Uh, I see the future of geospatial as the next IT, if I can say so. Uh, yeah, uh, well, the best part of uh, uh, the geospatial data is how we can even engage uh, the community and citizens to be a part of this. Uh, you see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, ground data, is some, ground geospatial data is something that is of utmost importance and something is difficult to get hold of. But by involving communities, and it is already happening, that people map so many areas, for example, forest type of trees, and also take part in validation process of this. So there's also good community-based mm -hmm. geospatial data that is coming up. And uh, also things like uh, digitizing a property, farm, this is also an ongoing process. So having these will bring a lot of transparency in uh, various processes going ahead. So that's how I can see the geospatial being involved in the future. And I think that's an excellent yeah. point. You, you, you remind me of, uh, you know, the one of the best disaster management application that I've seen in Australia. It's by the Red Cross, uh, where every Australian community, I mean, it's, it's a district, I don't know what they call it. Uh, as they have the citizen uh, awareness tool where they talk about forest fires happening um, uh, in a nearby. So they kind of validate what the satellite is giving and what we are facing. And that way, firefighters can also kind of uh, monitor where the most, you know, what kind of... Uh, attention was a priority of the of the of the day so yeah so it's i think uh, that way you know extending geospatial and kind of bringing it down to uh, uh, from the uh, look uh, you know the citizen uh, ownership of it it's uh, adds value to a varied sector there's a very interesting uh, point on the chat i don't know if you guys have seen it it's um, yeah we'll read it out uh, so lakshmi narsimhan says he had a satellite training session today in the morning for about like 50 people for the Asian region, you know, and then the top users uh, for uh, top end user applications were basically the, you know, broadband and mobile, not, not surprisingly. So, and GIS, unfortunately, was at the very end of the list. So how can we as a community, you know, make GIS more aware? Um, yeah, basically, how do we educate the market? 
I, I will give one example of this. I think uh, one, uh, you know, um, in Europe, I've seen it happen in many uh, SR run uh, business incubation centers where it's not. When you talk about business incubation, it's typically you feel entrepreneurs like us are built with the audience such centers, but uh, we found uh, school children were uh, brought over for educating on uh, various applications of GIS. How do how do they see the see the world? How do you really uh, analyze your uh, a vegetation farm from a Google image? So I think you know knowledge of GIS should start at the school level. And it should not wait till a college education for a person to understand the application of GIS data. And the one organization I can definitely name SSERD, who is doing a lot of work around this uh, uh, educating uh, kids, uh, educating young minds. Uh, and uh, yeah, apart from that, of course, you know, uh, what you uh, pointed out that, you know, uh, you know, uh, companies like us can uh, you know also educate government functions where we uh, tell our policymaker uh, one of the questions to really address it and what Sobita said you know your property tax system how do you use GIS data for such digitization of properties so I think government function education but stop, do both ends start from the young minds to the ones who is managing uh, uh, the managing a nation. Okay, interesting. We have one more question by Hi hey Prashant. Nice to see you here. So from Prashant Butani. So he says, what are the biggest challenges that entrepreneurs in the GIS domain face when developing IP or establishing a competitive advantage for themselves? Yeah, Divina, I think it's for you. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I think uh, you know, IP. You will. Re I mean, you really have to find your find your niche for that matter. I don't know if there's a GIS uh, a related, um, you know, a complication to that uh, game. Uh, uh, but again, I, I would I would definitely say don't look at a problem from just the GIS perspective. If you're just trying to, you know, find a, a uniqueness in your case, but I'm saying I'm just going to use GIS data for all the problem. It might not give in, give, in, give you a competitive edge, look at it as a problem, and then first understand what is the business functions so of business questions, then look at the data points that can address those business questions and the data points can be a spatial or non spatial data. Uh, what you are, uh, what kind of data you're getting or what kind of algorithm you're applying to it? What is a, is a clustering problem or a regression problem that is comes way later? Uh, but so if I don't know if I've answered your question correctly, uh, look at it as a problem, but don't give it a you know, spatial, non-spatial, uh, you know, analysis. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, I guess no one else has any questions, but if you guys, yeah, anyone uh, listening, please, please type your questions. Please feel free to also, uh, yeah, raise a hand. I guess there's a raise hand option or not. Yeah. Please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, yeah. So meanwhile, uh maybe i would like to one of my last questions is for shobita actually because um, so this is about the next steps right so for uh, devlina or krishna the next steps are quite I, I see your future you know where you're headed uh devlina wants to make you enumerate a, a unicorn or sorry not unicorn but whatever the alternative word for unicorn and i also see krishna you know rising in sature or you know continuing your work in the industry uh, but what what comes next for you, Shobita? Like so, so as someone who's researching on air pollution, right? Will you have opportunities, uh, you know, after your PhD, or how, how does it look for you the next career path? Yes. Um, well, the ratio of uh, uh, you know opportunities out there to the PhDs that come out is of course uh, less. I mean, there's less opportunity and more of PhDs, but. Uh, still within those opportunities, so it depends on you want to go to academia or you know uh, to private industrial sectors. Um, in academia, you have opportunities in universities, or if you want to go much more deeper into the uh, into research, there's postdoc, a lot of postdoc opportunities to continue in the field that you want. And of course, in industry sites, you have you can uh, be consultant or geospatial analyst. Uh, there's numerate, sure so. Companies like that, which provide us opportunities, right? Uh, other than that, one one more thing that's interesting is you can also be a freelance uh, uh, individual researcher in this particular field, which uh, also will be quite interesting. Wow! So yeah, I think, yeah. I think Shobita is the best place to really uh, bring in the education we're talking about to the industry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
interesting. So yeah, I think our uh, 60 minutes exactly is up. So I guess we've had a pretty very educative for me, very interesting for me. I hope everyone also felt the same. Um, I guess we, I haven't bored. Uh, it's, it's a good conversation, I feel, because hardly anybody has dropped out. <laughs> so that's a good sign of success. <laughs> Happy to know. Yeah, I wish it was not only really boring and pedantic. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm sure it was uh, quite interesting. So yeah, I guess, um, I guess we can end it now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, folks. It's been like super, super fun, super interesting. And I think this will be, yeah, this will be uh, published online and sat, yeah, please check out the Sat Sure page where you can access this later. And I guess all the links to all the panelists and myself will also be, um, yeah, listed there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sat Sure. Thank you, Rashina, uh, Shobita, uh, Krishna. It was lovely chatting you with both of you. And yeah, thank you all. Thank you, audience. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for attending and thank you, Rachna.